I prayed all week. That I would not get up here and ball. <laughs> so we're going to start off with something. Uh, there were two women, Shirley and Sue, they were at Walmart. They'd been good friends and uh, they hadn't seen each other in a long time. So Shirley, Sue asked Shirley said, uh, if she had ever married. And uh, to which Shirley replied, she had married a wonderful man. And Sue said, oh, that's good news. Shirley said, no, that's bad news. He was a mean, mean, mean man. But however, he was a rich man. Shirley said, oh, that's good news. Sue said, oh, that's that's." That's good news. Shirley said, no, that's bad news because he was stingy. Oh, he was so stingy. That, but he did build me a beautiful home. It had everything that you wanted in. Sue said, oh, that's great news. Shirley said, no, that's bad news. The house burned down. So Sue said, oh, that's bad news. Shirley said, no, that was good news because he was in it. <laughs> so the Bible is full of good news and bad news. And uh, as I was, uh, and by the way, I want to thank all of you that have prayed for me. I received a text this morning from Brother Austin. said he was praying for me. You don't know what that means when they break for it. I don't know why he picked on me. I don't think I'm that old. <laughs> In my heart, I feel like I could run a marathon. If they had an AMR ambulance behind me. But anyway, I want to talk to you this morning on a very familiar subject. And if, if you don't know it, you can turn to it. It's John chapter 3. And we'll be talking about John 3.16. But as I was trying to get everything together, kind of get my thoughts together, and about 3 o'clock this morning, the Lord spoke to me and he said, uh, you're going to be fine. But it's not about you. It's about me. And that's what I want it to be. Don't look at me. Just look at Jesus. And then, if you know him as your personal Savior, then when we meet him face to face, our finite minds right now can only imagine what's going to but I was reminded, and I, I'm going to get to the text, okay? I just need to run around and grab it here, too. But as I was uh, looking over some things that I had, and Helen told me, he said, you need to start off with something funny. And I said, well, I don't know what that did. But anyway, I ran across this little article that I, I don't know how long I've had it. And you can see the way I've cut it out, uh, that I'm not a very good cutter either. But it, uh, it's entitled The Explanation of God. And we're going to be talking about God here in just a few minutes, okay? It's, uh, it says it's a wonderful story written by an eight year old boy in his uh, school class. The, the teacher had asked uh, to explain God. And now this was written by an eight year old boy. In another place in Chula Vista, California. Now, if you know anything about California, they don't, as far as I know, they don't believe in God. At least they don't come across that. But anyway, this little boy said, one of God's main jobs is making people. 
He makes them to replace the ones that died so there will be enough people to take care of things on earth. You don't make grown-ups, you just make babies. And I think because they are smaller and easy, I think it's because they're, they're, they are smaller and easier to make. That way he doesn't have to take up his valuable time teaching them to talk and to walk. He can just leave that to mothers and fathers. God's second most important job is listening to prayers. An awful lot of this goes on since some people like preachers and things pray at times beside bedtime. God doesn't have time to listen to the radio or TV because of this. Because he hears everything, there, is, there must be a terrible lot of noise in his ears unless he has thought of a way to turn it off. God sees everything and hears everything and is everywhere, which keeps him pretty busy. So you shouldn't go around wasting his time going behind his back, uh, going behind over your mom and dad, dad's head asking for something they said that you couldn't have. Atheists are people who don't believe in God. I don't think we have any here in Chula Vista. At least there isn't any who come to our church. Jesus is God's son. He used to do all the hard work. Which kept him pretty busy. So he shouldn't go wasting his time. Uh, as I said, he shouldn't go over his head, but wasting time. But the atheist, he said, I don't believe there's any atheist in our church. Jesus is God's son. He's used to do all the hard work like walking on water and performing miracles and trying to teach the people who didn't want to learn about God. They finally got tired of him and they crucified him. But he was good and kind like his father. And he told his father they, that they didn't know uh, that they didn't know what they were doing and to forgive them and God said, okay. His dad, God, appreciated everything his son had done. All of his hard work on earth, so he told him he didn't have to go out on the road anymore. He could stay in heaven. So he did. And now he helps his dad out by listening to prayers and seeing things which are important for God to take care of and which ones he can take care of himself without having to bother God like a secretary or something like that. You can pray anytime you want and you're and they are sure to help you because they got it worked out for one of them is on duty all the time. And you should always go to church on Sunday because it makes God happy. And if there's anything you want to do, is to make God happy. Don't skip church to do something you think will be more fun, like going to the beach. That is wrong because the sun don't come up from the moon at the beach anyway. If you don't believe in God, besides being an atheist, you will be very lonely because your parents can't go everywhere with you like to camp, and God can. It's good to know he's around you when you're, when you're scared in the dark or when you can't swim and when you get thrown into real deep water by big kids. But you shouldn't just always think of God, of what God can do for you. I figure God has put me here and he can take me back any time that he pleases. And that's why I believe in God. As I said, Brother Olson asked me a few weeks ago, and, and, and this ought to be a lesson to people, don't hang around the preacher, okay? <laughs> <laughs> he asked me a few weeks ago, he said, he asked me this question, he said, uh, what's your favorite Bible verse? And uh, I told him that what it was, and he said, well, why don't you share that with the church uh, in a few weeks? And of course, I said, okay. But Brother Austin has entrusted me to be here to fulfill, to fulfill the pulpit for him. And I'm honored to do that. I'm totally incapable of doing that. But God has given me the ability 
to stand before you this morning. And I'll tell you, I, my stomach is just literally flipping and carrying on. I don't know why I have, I have stood by before hundreds of preachers and, and made a talk and it didn't seem to bother me at all. But before the home crowd church, it just absolutely, I'm just churning inside. So you pray for me. I know you will. But Brother Austin, as I said, he's entrusted me to, to speak to you all today. And I don't know why. But I, I, like I say, I do count it as a privilege to be here this morning and to tell you about what God has done in my life. How he's worked in my life. And I hope by sharing this with you that uh, maybe if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, my prayer is that you would come to know him before you leave here today. And uh, uh, with all of that being said, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go forward. Okay, Father, you know what's going on in my heart right now. You know, all the fluttering that's going on. But Lord, I pray that you would just take these words. They'll probably be scattered. I won't make any sense to anybody. But Lord, I pray that you would take them, put them in the proper order. And Father, that through me speaking them through you, again, that someone, May be touched by the words this morning. That, that they may be lifted out of that dark spot in their life that they may be going through now. Father, just help them, I pray. Calm the fears. Speak through me. In your name I pray. Amen. As I said, if you know, if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, today would be the greatest day, beautiful sunshine day, to come to know Him as your personal Savior. Now, it could be rainy and gloomy, and still you can come to know Christ as your personal Savior. Today would be a great day. And, uh, but now, I mean, when you're once saved, it's not going to be an easy road. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that right up front. And that's one reason I, and I, I told the, the men here Wednesday night that uh, once you're saved, hey, it's not going to be easy. Because once again, I face Satan this morning, and I'll battle him all the day long. But in my weakness, God's bring reinforcements. And at sundown, I'll be able to sing victory song because the sun is going to come up. Now, let me just chase a rabbit for me. Well, that's all you know. But let me just chase a rabbit this morning. There may be some of you here this morning that don't really know Bud Hodge. And that's a shame. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I, I'd love to tell you that I was born about seven miles. In fact, you, the first row of mountains you see up here, Chill High Mountains, that's my home stomping grounds. And I was raised there. And uh, a lot of good people up there. And uh, I lived in a little community called Rocky Branch. And uh, I was lived there most of my life until a certain girl come along and said she needed to marry me and, you know, and I said well I'll take you out of your misery and, and all of that and, but all the all the years I lived growing up in Rocky Branch there was one road that I never went on to this day I've never been on that road I, will, I won't mention the name of it you may have some kinfolk that live up there but to, I have no intentions of going down that road even today. And oh, I wish, 
Oh, how I wish that something would have told me not to go down the roads that I've been down. Because I didn't need to go down that road. But God gave me a free will. And the Bible is full of people that has traveled down the wrong roads of life. They knew better just as I knew better. And just like all of us, they have learned the hard way. Now, some of you probably know me, that know me pretty well, know that also that I love Southern Gospel music. Uh, I, for some reason, it's just my cup of tea. And uh, I try, try to incorporate some of the songs into teaching and even speaking. And, and, uh, uh, and I've tried to do that, even that this morning. By the way, if, if you enter it, you may not be interested, but I have several hundred long play albums, cassette tapes and videos and all of that, and, and I enjoy sitting and listening to them. But may I just start out with this? May I just start out with this? Once I was clothed in the rags of my sins, wretched and poor, Lost and lonely within, but with wondrous compassion, the King of all kings, in pity and love, took me under his wings. Oh yes, oh yes, I'm a child of the King. His royal blood now flows in my veins. And I, who was wretched and poor, now can sing, praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. Now, my old life was not always a life of praise. At age 14, I came to know Christ as my personal Savior. I was saved during the revival in a church there in Rocky Branch, and, and uh, nothing happened. You say, but what do you mean nothing happened? They had no programs to teach me. They had nothing to, nobody to lead or guide me. They, it kind of was like the impression, well, you're saved, now you're good to go. But I would like to say, I could tell you all the things I did after that day, but there's no need to go into all of that. It, it was not pretty. Now, after a few years of wandering and confused and lost, God had different plans for my life. In fact, James 4, 17 tells us that therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is a sin. I knew to do better. I knew to do better. I was raised in a great Christian home. I knew to do better. But you know, I know now beyond any shadow of doubt that I'm blood bought. I'm on my way to heaven. And if you know Christ as your personal Savior, and if you live for Him each and every day, then you can say with me, just wait. Just wait till you see my brand new home. My Heavenly Father is building for me. And I'm going to occupy for free. Just wait. Do you see my brand new home? Oh, I wish all of you today that could get that feeling this morning that uh, those of you that know Christ as your personal Savior, if there's any doubt of what your destination is going to be, you need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is working in your life. Now, I said all of that to say this. John 3, 16. John 3, 16, that will be the text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever believe on him would have everlasting 
but not perish, but have the everlasting life. May I say it this way? This might be a little clearer to you. For God, the greatest person, so loved the world, the greatest passion, that he gave his only son the greatest gift, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, the greatest promise. That's great, but I like to say it this way. For God so loved the heart that he gave his only begotten son so that Bud Hodge could have everlasting life. That's the way that I, I've heard John 3, 16 all my life. But I like to put it, that puts it on a personal level there to me. And we also know that John 3, 16 is not only my personal, personal verse, but it's also probably one of the best well-known uh, love stories in the Bible probably with the exception of the 23rd Psalm. It's good news in the midst of bad news. A bad man can be made good. A good man can be made bad. It's the answer to redemption. God's love is real. God's love is real. It has no beginning and it has no end. His love is everlasting. He's as real today as he was to Adam and Eve in the garden. And there's no real love without giving. There's no real giving without love. And no one will ever know until the judgment seat of Christ how many millions have found their way to heaven by this verse, John 3, 16. In fact, I was, as I was uh, studying and looking over some things, I, I ran across this by a story by D.L. Moody, the great evangelist back in the 1800s. He was one to the Lord. Uh, it's untold how many millions have come to know Christ through D.L. Moody, but he came, he came to the Lord through a man by the name of, of, uh, of uh, Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. Edward Kimball was a shoe salesman. And D.L. Moody at that time was just, a, I think, about 17 years old. And Edward Kimball, God laid it on Edward Kimball's heart that he needed to go speak to Dwight L. Moody because he had been in his Sunday school class and he, he felt like the D.L. Was, was searching for something. And he goes and he witnesses to him. And uh, through that witnessing, that Sunday school teacher, that shoe salesman, through all of that, Dwight Moody come to, be, come to know Christ as his personal Savior became a great evangelist. Many millions of people have come to know through him through the uh, through his preaching, and he was in Newton. It was in England one day on one of his crusades, and he met another young man by the name of of uh, Henry Morehouse, and the Englishman was greatly drawn to D. L. Newton. Uh, the story goes that Henry Morehouse asked. Mr. Moody, if he would let him preach at his church, if sometime he would be in Chicago, and D.L. said to him, well, sure, that's fine, but he, D.L. Moody thought in his mind that'll never happen. He'll never come to America. But it wasn't too much later that Henry Morehouse showed up at Dwight L. Moody's doorstep. And he was there to redeem that place that he wanted to preach in D.L. Moody's church. So reluctantly, D.L. Moody surrendered his pulpit and he promised the, the leaders of the church that this man made a fool of, it, of himself, kind of like me, that he made a fool of himself and he would be there to rescue the situation. 
But that night, Henry Morehouse took as his text John 3, 16. John 3, 16. And he preached on the love of God with such passion and power that an odd moody invited him to speak again the next time. And, um, and Henry Morehouse got up the next night. His text was John 3, 16. And he preached again. Booty was overwhelmed. Why did he would speak on that? In fact, uh, Henry Morehouse became known as the man who moved the man who moved millions. And on the last night of the prayer service, Henry Morehouse said to the people, he said these words to the people, I've been trying to tell you how much God loves you. Suppose I could borrow Jacob's ladder. Suppose I could ascend that shining stairway until my feet stood on the sapphire pavements of the city of God. Suppose I could find Gabriel, the herald angel, who stands in the presence of God. And suppose I should say to Gabriel, tell me, Gabriel, how much does God love the world? And I know what he would say. He would say, Henry Morehouse, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's how much God loves the world. Now, with all that being said, there's one word in that verse that I think should be draw our attention to, and that word is perish. What does the word perish mean? It means exactly what it says. Perish. Did you know that sinners take with them into eternity their unquenchable thirst, their terrible passions, their appetites, their mad cravings, their inflamed desires, their fierce longings and furious hates, their lust, their wine-hot tempers, and their spine-chilling fear. That's what a man takes into eternity if he does not know Christ is his personal Savior. And this word perish tells us the final condition of the soul. The awful state of those who are filthy still under the eye of God. This great verse which summarizes the whole gospel story begins with God and it ends with everlasting life. It begins with one who had no beginning. And it ends with that which has no ending. Oh, the love of God. Oh, the love that God has for you and for me. The love of God is greater far than any tongue or pen can tell. It reaches to the high stars and covers all the world. Its power is eternal. Its glory is supernal. When all this earth shall pass away, there will always be the love of God. So let me ask you a question. And you can answer it in your own, own time, in your own quiet time. Why haven't we told this story? Why haven't I told this story? In my case and in your case, I was always too busy. I was always too busy trying to live my life the way that I wanted to live it. I was too busy trying to make a living, to make sure my family was clothed and fed. I was too busy working to get the 
things of life, the luxuries that life has to offer. I was too busy. I was too busy doing other things that took away my time from reading and studying the Bible. I was too busy wanting people to think highly of me. And most of all, I was too busy trying to have my family to think I was the best husband and the best dad that ever walked upon the face of the earth. I was too busy. But you know, with all that being said, now I have to pinch myself and ask these questions. Who am I? Who are you? Rusty Goodman wrote a song. Some of you probably know. It goes like this. When I think of how he came so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly, such as I, to suffer shame and such disgrace, on Mount Calvary take my place. It's then I ask this question, who am I? When I'm reminded of his words, I'll leave you never. I'll give to you a life forever. I wonder what I could have done to deserve God's only son to fight my battles until they're won. Who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I to say not thine will, thy will thine for? The answer I may never know. Why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he'd go. Who am I? Let me share with you this. Getting back to the question that Austin asked me, what would I do if it was my last step on the earth? Just suppose the Lord should begin tomorrow to make people as sick as they say they are on Sunday. Just suppose the Lord should take away that child whom the parents use as an excuse for staying away from the church. Just suppose the Lord should make some people as poor as they say they are when it comes to giving to his programs. Just suppose the Lord should have everyone stoned for covetousness as he did Achan in the Old Testament, you'll find that story in Joshua chapter 7. Then there's also a, a man and a woman in, uh, in Acts chapter 5 uh, where they lied about giving to the Lord's work. Just suppose the Lord should let some parents who look in, to look into the future and just see what their, what their example and their last control did for their child. Just suppose all Christians should really live consistently and provide by their life and prove by their lives that they really love the Lord. And just suppose by the help of the Lord that we as Christians would go forth and live and serve him as if eternity was coming today. What if? May I share something else with you too? If this was your last day of earth, when when you are in your final days, and we all are, what will you want? What will you want most? Will you hug that college degree certificate that's hanging on the wall? Will you want to be carried out to the garage so you can see your car?
Will you find comfort in rereading your financial status? I think we could all say, of course not. What will matter then will be people. If today was the last day for me, it would be people. It would be relationships. They would matter the most. And if that would happen, if we knew that would happen on our last day, the last day on earth, why can't it happen today? Why can't it happen today? Going back to the question that Austin asked me, what if this is my last day on earth? Personally, I would try to witness to everyone that I came in contact with and tell them about the love of God. How Jesus loves them. I would contact all my friends and try to make sure that they were ready to meet the Lord. I'd gather all my family around. And really to celebrate my home going. And let them know that I love them. And for them to always live for Christ. I say all of that to say this. I have one very close friend. I don't know if he knows Christ as his personal Savior or not. It's up to me to find out. But I know from the life that he's living, he's not a Christian. So I need to find out about that. And let me just close with this. And I know you say, probably say, well, thank goodness he's through. But let me just close with this. And I hope I can say it the way I feel it. The blessed Savior wrote my name when I was born again. He wrote it when he saved my soul. He wrote that I had made it right and that all my sins are gone. He wrote my name on heaven's roll. If I should live a thousand years or more upon this earth below, I never shall forget the day that God, Jesus, wrote my name within that blessed book of life. And he took my every sin away. He wrote my name in glory. He saved my soul from sin and shame. I never shall forget the day the blessed Savior wrote my name. Let me ask you this morning. Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Do you know him today? Do you need to seek forgiveness? I will be down in the front here if anyone wants to talk to me. And I appreciate you listening so so patiently for, a, for an old man, okay? And uh, Brother Stu, you go ahead.